Good evening. Uh, I'm Trevor Morris, and I'm, I'm the dean. Uh, I wish it were the case that once we're standing up here, we could take our masks off. And if I were setting the rules, um, I think I would set a rule that we can. But I think we should follow uh, NYU's protocols here. And so that means uh, keeping our masks on even while up here. Um, so I promise I'm Trevor Morris, and even if I'm not recognizable with this. Um, and it, I really am thrilled to, uh, to welcome you all and everyone joining us on Zoom as well to the 25th annual Attorney General Robert Abrams Public Service Lecture. Um, this is a great fixture annually in our calendar here at the law school um, and is one of the very first non-class in-person events we've had here in the, in the COVID era um, and, and fitting that this annual fixture would, would serve that role here. Uh, the public service lecture, the, the Abrams public service lecture, has for a quarter century now uh, really been a hallmark uh, of the law school's commitment to public service, uh, which is a deep one, as I think you all know. Um, it honors, of course, our esteemed alumnus, Robert Abrams, NYU class of 1963. Um, and this year's speaker is also an NYU law graduate, the Colorado Attorney General, Phil Weiser, and I want to say how grateful I am to Phil for his joining us today. Um, Bob Abrams will introdu introduce General Weiser just in a moment, but let me just say a few words more uh, by way of introduction. Um, one of the things that makes this law school the special place that it is, is the deep institutional commitment to public service. And that takes a lot of different forms. Um, it's manifested, of course, in our Public Interest Law Center, uh, which provides, I think, unsurpassed infrastructural support to our students interested in public service and public interest, led by the spectacular Lisa Hoyes, um, our assistant dean in charge of Pilk, herself a graduate of the law school um, and uh, active in Pilk when she was here as a student. And it's important that we devote those resources to supporting our students in their pursuit of careers in the public interest and in public service, and that we have a curriculum that supports their learning in that space, both through our clinics and otherwise, but it's also important, indeed equally if not more important, that we have an alumni community who themselves embody excellence in public service. And that what we mean to teach our students in preparing them for a career in public service is what it means to render that service honorably, uh, what it means to uphold integrity in the law and in the profession, an obligation that every lawyer has, I think, uh, as a matter of their participation in the profession but in particular those who are serving in public interest. Um, these days uh, have, I fear, given us more examples of people charged with public trust who abuse it um, and who don't themselves embody the values we want to instill in our students. And so when we have an opportunity to lift up our graduates in public service as models of excellence and integrity in public service, we do that. There is no better model of that than Bob Abrams. Um, his career in public service is just a spectacular example of dedication to the public good. A 28-year career in government, he was a member of the New York State Assembly, served three terms as the Bronx Borough President, and in 1978 was elected to, the, to serve the first of four terms as New York's Attorney General. And while in that role, he really defined the modern State Attorney General, um, both in terms of the substantive good that that office holder can do, and in terms of the norms of professional integrity that uh, should be expected of any occupant of that role and that he uh, demonstrated so spectacularly. Uh, through, throughout his entire career, uh, Bob really provides the kind of model that I'd like all of our students to aspire to. We're really grateful to Bob for his continued involvement to, with and dedication to the school, including through this annual lecture. Um, Bob, thank you indeed. Congratulations on 25 years of this lecture. Um, and let me ask all of you to join me in welcoming Bob Abrams. Thank you so much, Dean. Uh, it's such a uh, privilege to be here each year, and it's hard to believe that this is the 25th year. Um, first of all, let me, let me just thank Lisa Hoyes, Gail Zweig, 
the staff, uh, 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 Matty uh, Montes Dioka, who recently joined the staff and uh, has been so helpful to put this together, especially during this difficult period. Uh, uh, this room in the past has always been filled and it's more difficult under these circumstances um, because uh, outsiders who have joined us in the past uh, just can't do it this year. And those who are here, normally at the end of our presentation, we'd go and enjoy a repast, some wonderful food, but that's not allowed uh, during under these circumstances as well. But the fact that we're able to do it at all uh, is an, uh, in person is an achievement uh, given these circumstances. Um, 25 years, uh, it's hard to believe that so much time has gone by, but we come here today, this lecture is as relevant and, uh, today as it was 25 years ago when it was created. I went to the then Dean, John Sexton, and I said, John, I'm worried, I'm nervous. Uh, the media, whenever they talk about politics and often about government, uh, it, it's a downer. There's a, there's a discussion about uh, competence, about uh, the dark side of politics. Uh, we, we need young people, we need young lawyer, law students to think about becoming lawyers and entering politics. We need their idealism, we need their energy, we need their potential solutions to the problems that confront us. And so I said, you know, my experience has been over a long period of time that those who I worked with in government were good people, they were honest, they were dedicated, uh, they were committed to public service, and I, I, I want students to see those people. And for 25 years we've done that, it kicked off with a spectacular public of, uh, servant and public official, Joe Lieberman, and it culminates tonight in the silver anniversary with another extraordinary human being and person who uh, has had a wonderful career and uh, now is uh, the great attorney general of the state of Colorado, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about him. Uh, uh, they represent what you should aspire to an opportunity for leadership, for service, uh, for contribution. Um, and, and Phil Weiser, um, a guy who spent years in the Bronx, you know, I mean, the Bronx, uh, uh, they, they say you can take the boy out of the Bronx, but you can't take the Bronx out of the boy. And Phil spent a number of years growing up in the Bronx and then moved on to parts of Westchester and elsewhere. Um, an, an extraordinary life. Um, the son of Holocaust survivors, a mother who was born in Buchenwagen, uh, Buchenwald uh, concentration camp, uh, knowing therefore growing up about what deprivation and depravity is all about. Um, an outstanding student uh, going to Swarthmore, graduating at the top of his class, coming to this extraordinary law school, doing well, graduating with honors, being on the law review, being the articles editor, and then deciding to pursue public service, uh, clerking for a judge in the 10th Circuit, and then clerking for Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg in the United States Supreme Court, and Justice Byron White, and then uh, joining others uh, in Washington in pursuit of public service, being in the Clinton administration, being in the Obama uh, administration, serving in the White House, serving as the senior counsel to the uh, assistant attorney general in charge of the antitrust division in the Justice Department, uh, doing very important work, cutting edge stuff, and then becoming an academic. Uh, going to Colorado and becoming a professor and becoming the dean and developing programs, again, pioneering at the cutting edge, important on telecommun uh, important programs uh, on telecommunications, technology, um, having experts come together and lecture and not only uh, disseminate information to the people of Colorado, but to the people of the region and, and, of, and the whole country. Um, Phil Weiser then, did the unlikely thing, the dean of a law school, 
running, getting involved in politics and running for public office and running for attorney general. Uh, the people of Colorado didn't know of him at the outset, didn't have name recognition, and then, and yet he was able to prevail in a primary fight and then prevail in a tough general election and take the reins of that office. And, and his quality shown initially, right away, he became a leader of attorneys general, the, becoming the chair of the Western Conference uh, of Attorneys General. Uh, uh, being a person who is in the lead of, of multi-state litigation, uh, leading 36 states in the uh, lawsuit and investigation of Google in terms of anti-competitive practices, uh, taking on important issues relating to consumers, civil rights, and the environment, um, and doing it all uh, as a person of, uh, of deep conviction and integrity, uh, initiating an important uh, program uh, the Ginsburg Scalia Initiative, pointing to something corrosive in our society and how we can try to get away from it, remediate it. You know, uh, polarization taking place in our politics, in our communities, um, division, tribalism. Phil Weiser saying, we're better than that. And Ruth Bader Ginsburg and Antonin Scalia represented what I'm talking about. They were people of polar extreme, extremes. They had different philosophies. They had different points of view, but they respected one another. They worked well with each other. They admired each other. They were collaborative. And that's what this country and society should be all about. And so again, exercising leadership, trying to have attorneys general think more about how they conduct themselves and and spread that out into the broader society, how we as a nation should be uh, united and not polarized. And so uh, it's a pleasure for me, it's an honor for me to introduce a person to come to this microphone who will inspire you because of who he is and what his life and his values are all about. Uh, a man of ability, a man of leadership, a man of courage, a man of integrity, a man of uh, of demonstrated commitment to public service, a man of achievement in all of the different positions that he's held, and somebody who I think is proud uh, to come back to his alma mater and help inspire students here who will be the leaders of tomorrow as they pursue lives and careers in public service. I, I talk about in my book uh, how I'm the luckiest guy in the world for a whole variety of reasons. I'm lucky tonight, in addition to what's in here, uh, to be able to introduce you to the great Attorney General of Colorado, Phil Weiser. The honor is truly mine. It's great to be with all of you for the silver anniversary of the Abrams Lecture. And I want to begin with what is a familiar Yiddish expression, which is, let me say a few words before I speak. <laughs> By the way, that goes over at different rates in different <laughs> crowds. The opportunity here to speak at my alma mater, which launched my career in public service, is very meaningful. And it's really meaningful at a lecture named for Bob Abrams, who is a mensch. If you don't know about Bob's career, let me say a word or two more than what Trevor did. Um, he served as New York Attorney General and he transformed the position. Here's what Governor David Patterson said about him. He fought fiercely for the people of this state, protecting consumer and civil rights, launching groundbreaking efforts in the areas of environmental protection and criminal prosecution. He left an indelible mark on New York's history. He did. He also left an indelible mark on many individuals, showing that politics is both a team sport and about people. I first met Bob in the early 1970s when I was living in the Bronx after a Saturday morning services where they were serving a kiddish. And he was there shaking hands with people because he always loved and cared about people. When I interviewed him for his book, he said that his goal was always to make a difference, to serve people. 
And he was driven by a goal, that public service should be an inspired goal. And I know that affected me, Bob, and so many others. When I think about my career arc, when I was where you are now, I think a lot about the people here who helped me get launched. When I was a 1L, we put together a reading group with professors like Vicki Bean, who I know is still on the faculty. When I was on the Law Review, we had many engaging conversations about matters of pressing legal scholarship. When I was here as a student, I heard many speakers, including across the hall, then Judge Ruth Bader Ginsburg, later Justice, who delivered her Madison lecture, which I would encourage to all of you as worthy of your time. When I was here, there was a speaker series, a public service series, where I had my interests and path developed, including meeting Al Gerhardstein, a NYU law alum who's practicing civil rights law in Cincinnati, Ohio. I also had professors who were extraordinary mentors and now friends like Chris Eisgruber, Vicki Bean, Ricky Rivez, and Bill Nelson. They encouraged me on my path, including that first job as a law clerk to Judge David E. Bell, which brought me to Colorado and really shaped my journey. So for all the students here, I would encourage you to reflect about your path. And one of the opportunities in your path would be even to maybe come to the Colorado Attorney General's Office or the New York Attorney General's Office. In Colorado last summer, or last spring, I think we had Alex Liguri, who worked with us on some really important cutting edge water law issues. And we've of course learned how to have people work remotely. If you're interested in that, please talk to me afterwards. As you think about your journey, I would commend to you a quote by Ralph Waldo Emerson. Do not go where the path may lead. Go instead where there's no path and leave a trail. I would encourage all of you not to only do what is easy or right in front of you, but to really reflect as to where and how you might make a difference. And that might be outside of New York City. It might be outside of Washington, D.C. Right now, states and local governments are playing an extraordinarily important role and need people like you. Here's what Bob had to say about his view of politics and government. In the course of my lifetime, I met able, honest people, Republicans and Democrats alike, working in government to implement the vision of our founders. I discovered in all the interactions and decision-making that there was respect shown for others and a listening ear that developed all points of view and that often through that, common ground could be achieved. That mindset, which I'll come back to, is very much what I have in mind with this Ginsburg Scalia initiative. So my theme tonight is gonna to focus on that and a commitment to respectful dialogue, to listening and to collaborative problem solving. But before I do that, I'd love to reflect a little about this role of state attorneys general and the rule of law, both of which were inspired and guided by Bob's leadership. Our constitution invented and developed a remarkable innovation, separation of powers. James Madison put it very well in one of his Federalist Papers, set up rival institutions, three branches of government, where ambition shall check ambition. There's another dimension to separating powers, federalism, separate powers for state and federal governments. In recent years, state attorneys general representing their states have played a very important role defending the rule of law and pursuing justice. It was an unfortunate feature of the last administration that the Justice Department of the United States adopted positions that failed to vindicate the rule of law. In a world where the Affordable Care Act was not being defended by the Justice Department, Efforts were being made to undermine a lawful census, and the program called DACA was being ended in an arbitrary and capricious way. It was state attorneys general who defended people of their states and the rule of law. 
In each of these cases, we prevailed. In each of these cases, we defended the rule of law and a commitment to constitutional governance, a governance that is about laws, not the whims of people in power. That's a core commitment which isn't about which party is in power. And as we think about this question about how we defend state authority and protect our constitutional and statutory rights, it's worth looking at a couple examples to get a little bit of a sense of how this works. And I'm gonna obviously focus on Colorado examples. The national government has a longstanding rule. It's called the burn jag rule where they provide funding for law enforcement. For years, that's how it worked. Unfortunately, in the last administration, the Department of Justice started attaching new requirements to this law enforcement program. And the new requirements were asking state and local entities to engage in immigration enforcement, acting as arms of the federal government, if you will. And if they refused to do so, they could lose financial support. In the statute, there was no basis for these conditions, and they offend the constitutional commitment to state sovereignty. We challenge that program and we won. Here's another example. For years, dating back to 1977 under Clean Air Act amendments, there was a clean car rules where states had a choice. They could either go with the federal model or they could adopt the California model. Colorado decided we're going to go ahead and use the Cal California model because the Trump administration wanted to dial back the federal protection. But that wasn't enough that they were dialing back the federal protection. They also wanted to pull the rug out from states like Colorado saying you could no longer opt to do what California had been doing. We challenged that affront to state sovereignty and were successful as well. What's important is, regardless of who the president is, state attorneys general are authorized to defend the rule of law and the people of their states, which makes plain that if a federal government doesn't follow the rules, there's somebody watching. I've often said, whoever's in the White House, I am committed to that principle. I'm going to defend the people of Colorado and the rule of law. And indeed, I've actually now taken our first challenge to a decision of the Biden administration because we're committed to protecting the people of Colorado and there's a issue under the Clean Water Act, Section 401, where the state certification process is not being given its due regard and we're defending state sovereignty in this administration. I've often talked about the rule of law. In fact, I talked about it so much on the campaign trail, my wife said to me, Phil, will you stop talking about the rule of law? Ordinary people don't know what it means. Several years later, people have said to me, I'm really glad you talked about the rule of law because it's really important. I get why it's important. Let me quote from Josh Shapiro, one of my friends and colleagues, who had something to say about the rule of law. The rule of law applies to everyone, no matter what they look like or where they come from or who they love or who they pray or choose not to pray to. The rule of law must apply to everyone. And when we create others in our system, when we separate people out, when we apply the laws unfairly, we erode our democracy. We erode the rule of law and we make everyone less safe. We make everyone weaker. Our nation is premised on equal justice under law. I think that's actually what it says at the US Supreme Court. We must continue to defend that basis. And if we erode it, if what party you belong to or how close you are to people in power defines how you're treated, we've lost the rule of law. There are a lot of nations around the world that don't have the rule of law and they envy the United States of America. Let me get to another thread that Bob teed up about listening and respectful dialogue because there can be a quick move from, oh, you're a Democratic Attorney General who sued the Justice Department about the Affordable Care Act, that must explain most of your work. And if you thought that, you would be missing the big picture because most of what we do is work with colleagues from other states to solve problems. And I will acknowledge that there are times when colleagues 
have done things that have been hard to watch, like the lawsuit brought by the Texas Attorney General to overturn the Electoral College. But I also take great inspiration that some stood up against members of their party, including Lawrence Wasden from Idaho, who had this to say about his decision to not join that lawsuit. He said, as is sometimes the case, the legally correct decision may not be the politically convenient decision. And he said his responsibility was to the state of Idaho and the rule of law. Not only are there attorneys general who will place principle over party, but there are so many issues that transcend party. For example, suing pharmaceutical companies who caused and contributed to our opioid crisis was something that we worked together arm in arm, those of us who are Democrats and those of us who are Republicans. We in Colorado led a case against McKinsey, who consulted with Purdue Pharma and the Sackler family. 47 states were with us, and I worked closely with a number of Republican attorney generals in that matter. Suing Google and Facebook, we have 40-something attorneys general working together to enforce our antitrust laws. And after January 6, we worked with other states to lead a letter calling for accountability and condemning the attack on our democracy, and 47 state AGs came together. I want to underscore that those relationships, that collaboration, owes a huge debt to our legal training. The rule of law and the rigor of legal analysis binds us together. We are not operating in an environment like those in a legislature where people might assert a supposed fact, but not have the discipline of having to prove it in court. Or people might take a certain position and not worry about whether there's legal support for it. That discipline, whether it's antitrust or consumer protection or public health, is a powerful and unifying platform that we can work with. This is a tradition of lawyers who are engaged in dialogue based on principles. And there is room for disagreement, seeing things differently. That's the same story that Ginsburg and Scalia had together. Here's what Justice Ginsburg had to say about it. If our friendship encourages others to appreciate that some very good people have ideas with which we disagree, and that, despite differences, people of goodwill can pull together for the well-being of the institutions we serve and our country, I will be overjoyed, as I'm confident Justice Scalia would be. At our best as lawyers, we operate within institutions and within norms that encourage asking questions, listening, learning, and collaborative problem solving. As Colorado's Attorney General, I've had the privilege of working in a state that takes these values seriously. We worked, for example, to pass a privacy law that passed our state senate unanimously. Now, I recognize this is not the world that we see in our national politics. At the national level, we're not seeing legislative processes work in a way that's consistent with collaborative problem solving, or some call it regular order, where committees will work together to develop legislation that will move up, as the schoolhouse rock Song said, I'm just a bill. In fact, the challenge is when you don't have institutions, you can have more of this toxic polarization or tribalism, and we're watching that this week. Jonathan Rausch, bemoaning this decline of institutional processes, says institutions are the enemy of tribalism, at least in the context of living in a liberal democracy. By definition, institutions can bring people together to work on common projects, building community. Many of our institutions, like the federal legislative ones, aren't working as they should. But many others, state attorneys general, state legislatures, are working that way. County commissions, city councils, what have you. From the perspective of being a state attorney general, I can see and celebrate this model of collaborative problem solving. And that's why I developed this Ginsburg Scalia initiative that is focused on collaborative problem solving and dialogue as norms that we need to hold on to. The idea is we can 
elevate civil discourse and demonstrate how people who might disagree can listen to one another and be engaged in dialogue. We can work to develop civic education that models that very situation. By doing so, we can overcome what is a threat to democracy, the threat that people view those with different viewpoints as other, what Josh Shapiro was afraid of, demonizing people, excluding people, seeing them as an alien, immoral, a threat. And that erodes all space for listening, for collaborative problem solving, and can even lay the groundwork for violence. When I think about the importance of listening, I also think about a story that was told about Thurgood Marshall. It's recounted by Stephen Carter, a Yale Law professor, and it comes from when Thurgood Marshall was on the Second Circuit. And during that time, there was a woman who filed a lot of complaints. They often call such individuals frequent filers. They were always dismissed. Her complaints included ones that the government installed electrodes in her brain to steal her ideas for TV shows. And as Marshall told this particular story, the chief judge of the Second Circuit, Judge Lombard, scheduled one of the woman's complaints for an oral argument. When given the turn, the woman spoke pretty much incoherently for 15 minutes. And then it was up to the US attorney, who basically stood up and was said what he was told he could say. May it please the court, we rest on our brief. At that point, Judge Lombard rose to his feet, and this was not a usual thing to do, and admonished the US attorney, saying, are you trying to tell me, young man, that after this woman exercising her fundamental right to petition the government came into a courtroom and argued her case and the government doesn't have the dignity to respond? Get up and argue, sir. The court ultimately dismissed the case without any comment. But critically, that was the last lawsuit the woman filed. Marshall saw a moral in that story. The woman in that case was listened to and felt heard. She felt respected. That's the way Bob Abrams approached politics, and that's the model that I seek to follow as well. I gave a talk a couple years ago at Colorado State University, and after the talk, a student came up to me and asked me why I was critical of a red flag law we were considering in Colorado. A red flag law can remove a firearm from someone who's a significant risk to themselves or others. And after he asked the question, somewhat in a pointed tone, I said, can I ask you a question? Why are you more worried about taking away a firearm from a responsible gun owner than not taking one away from a woman who might well kill herself that weekend? His answer to me was telling. He said, I've got to think about that. And he did think about it. And then he talked to his professor, and it got him more interested in thinking about public policy. He was taken seriously by me and his professor. And that encouraged him to approach dialogue in a more civil, engaged fashion. I don't think that interchange would have necessarily gone that way on Twitter, where people are all too quick to yell at one another, demonize one another, judge one another, condescend to one another. As a public official and as a lawyer, like the story from Justice Marshall, we should all work to take everyone seriously. In doing that, we're practicing kindness, empathy, and active listening. And if you're looking for a guide on how to do that, look no further than Fred Rogers. Fred Rogers, as explained by Tom Junod, who's the journalist in the film that I would strongly recommend to everyone, as Junod put it, was a man of vision. His vision was of the public square, a place full of strangers, transformed by love and kindness into something like a neighborhood. That vision depended on civility, on strangers feeling welcome in the public square, and so civility itself couldn't be debatable. It couldn't be the subject of politics, but rather had to be the basis of politics along with everything else worthwhile. So I wanna close with a suggestion, work on practicing empathy. If you can approach your life with an 
em empathy-based mindset, a learning-based mindset, you might find yourself looking for win-win solutions as opposed to thinking about the world in zero-sum terms. You might find, as Bob Abrams said, there's a lot of common ground if you can take time to listen, to reflect, and to look for collaborative solutions. That's what it means to work towards a more perfect union, and that's the work that I find so gratifying as Colorado's Attorney General. Thank you. So Phil has uh, consented to respond to some student questions, and uh, based upon my 25 years of experience, uh, students sometimes tend to be a little diffident and quiet, and they're not forthcoming. So I decided that the first one to ask a question is going to get a copy of my book. I signed it. So uh, uh, let's have some questions for Attorney General, uh, for, for the Attorney General from Colorado. And who is the first one who's going to get a copy of the book? Look at this. I can't even entice a first. I'm not afraid to call on people either. So. Yes, sir. Oh. You got a second one. Perfect. Is mic on? So, I'm, as a Denverite, I loved reading the complaint that you have against Google because all the figures and exhibits are all about searching for plumbers and such in Denver. And while I was reading the complaint, I wanted to think about how I could explain to my parents or a layman what the harm is in a non-priced market when, although I understand the market power, I want to understand what you think the true harm is to a consumer for a free good. So the question is about our complaint in Google. How can you have a harm to consumers in a market where consumers are not charged uh, money per se? The short answer is if that theory was correct, then every single radio station could merge with every other radio station. So we had a monopoly in all radio stations because radio stations are free. The problem with that line of thinking is it doesn't think about quality or advertising because we are paying for search. There's that famous line, if you're not being charged, you are the product. <laughs> We're paying for it because all our information is being collected and used to advertise to us and there might be other rival search engines if you had a competitive marketplace that could be more privacy friendly. So that's my first answer. But my second answer is there's another side of the market. Advertisers are paying for search advertising, which is true in the radio context as well. And they also are hurt by having a dominant firm who doesn't face competition. Consumers are better off in competitive markets. Innovators are better off in competitive markets. And businesses who have to buy a good, advertising, are better off competitive markets. That's the premise of our antitrust laws. And for those of you taking antitrust law tomorrow with Professor Hempel, you'll get to hear me talk about that. And for those of you who aren't, if you want to come by, you can email him and see if he can let you in the class. First of all, come and claim your book. Thank you. And uh, who's got the second question? So obviously in a large majority of states, the state attorney general position is elected and it's a political office. So how can state attorneys general best appear apolitical when they're investigating other public officials um, and uh, come out to a just solution that uh, without, without appearing as they're going for political gain? So the question is a deep question because I don't have the ability to truly shape what other people might think about me. So how can I not appear political? What I can do is act with integrity and do work that will be transparent and that will be based on facts and rigorous legal analysis. There's always a risk that people are going to judge that work through a political lens because I'm an elected official. My commitment is to have that integrity in how I do that work and to ask people to review the work themselves before discounting it 
by saying, because you're an elected official, can we trust you're operating with integrity? You have an example very close to home here. I'm going to let Bob talk about it because I know he followed it really closely, and I know that Tish James, who gave this lecture last year, is a mentee of Bob, as am I. She did what I described. She had an investigation of the governor of the same party that, by all accounts that I can see, she operated with integrity. And I use that sense in the same sense that Ronald Dworkin talks about it. She was seeking to operate under the legal standards, to find the facts, and reach conclusions that were supported. And that's something that lawyers do that is special about the legal system. We do our work in ways that is publicly reviewable. And I did think that's the, uh, an obvious answer. And I don't know if have people saw or thought she operated differently than that, but I think that is a responsive one. No, I think she, uh, her report stood on its weight, on its own. The public received it very well. Editorial boards across the state. Everybody felt she conducted herself appropriately. She was independent. She picked two people who were highly competent, highly experienced, with total integrity to conduct the investigation. They were thorough. They took months. They interviewed hundreds of people. They documented it in a very large report available for, the, for, for public scrutiny. And, uh, you know, I think uh, people said she did the right thing. She did her job. And there were many who were doubters because she had run with the governor in a very close way in the general election and was aided by the governor in a variety of ways, perhaps in the primary as well as in the general election. But as, the, as Attorney General Weiser said, the proof is in the pudding. You know, where she, she conducted herself in such a way that everybody saw that this was a first-rate, professional, independent job. And it's, it's a deep question, and it gets to the core of why Bob set up this lecture. It is easy to be cynical about elected officials, to discount all individuals who run for office. And if you look at opinion polls about who we trust, professors as a group get about 60% we trust professors. 60% of people trust professors. Elected officials, about 30%. My trust level got cut in half <laughs> the minute I was an elected official. I recognize that. I recognize I've got to earn my trust with the proof being in the pudding. And I would encourage all of you to reflect on the merits, not on the basis of the fact someone's an elected official, because it is a threat to our legal system, to our system of government, that the trust levels are as low as they are. Who else? Come on now, NYU is I'm not afraid to call on people, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> so. Uh, this law school is known for All right, got a couple. attracting uh, terrific students. Okay, here we go. Hi, thank you again for meeting with us and for putting this on. Um, there's this thing that people keep telling me that annoys me, which is law school doesn't prepare you to be a lawyer. And I've heard this over and over and over. And I want to ask you because you were a professor. Is the dean still here? No. Nope. Okay. Good, he's not here. Good. Um, but like, what are we not learning here? Like, what, what, basically my question is this. Like, what can we, I'm not a second year student. I got two years. Thank God it's in person. Like, what can we do to bridge that gap to be more prepared? And what do they mean when they say, we're not prepared to be lawyers? Like, what do you learn when you start practicing? And again, thanks for, for uh, being it's here. A good, it's a good question to ask, and I have got a few answers. The first one is what I heard when I graduated college from a sportscaster named Hayward Halebrun. Remember Hayward Halebrun? Mm. He said, at Swarthmore, I learned the value of lifelong learning and I've been paying the price ever since. <laughs> so the best thing you're gonna learn at law school is you're gonna learn how to learn. Lawyers are constantly learning. So at one level, don't ever view yourself as prepared because you're always learning. At another level, I think about an experience I had with Justice White, who was a senior judge. He was retired when I was working with him. He was sitting with the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals, and an individual was arguing before him and said, I'm sorry, Your Honor, 
this is my first case I'm arguing. I'm really nervous. Justice White said, counsel, stay nervous. So the second thing I would say is, no matter how often you've done something, stay nervous. By being nervous, by being vigilant, by being careful, you can do better work. And third, stay humble and keep asking questions from other people, so how you learn. I don't think that's what people are saying when they say that, by the way, but that's what I would say. What I think people are saying is a more technical point, which comes from Malcolm Gladwell. He calls it the 10,000 hours rule. You don't really develop a craft until you've done it for 10,000 hours. So you're not gonna write a high quality legal brief until you spend 10,000 hours writing a legal brief. So yes, you should do a moot court competition. I had a great experience at NYU doing the moot court. You should be on a journal because you're gonna write and writing takes time and you'll get better with that. You should take seminars where you write. You should think about doing a clinic where you'll have a chance to potentially examine a witness or file a motion. So I think what people are just saying is it takes time it's a 10,000 hour rule. But I would go back to the points I said, which is don't ever view yourself as your, again, accomplished or fully competent because all of us, myself absolutely included, are works in progress. We're still growing. And here's the thing. There's so many different competencies that you need. I continually reflect on how hard it is to do all the different competencies. For example, if you're gonna lead a team effectively, you've gotta be able to think about how do you set up a high functioning team in a safe and effective environment where everybody is able to share their views coming from a different perspective, you can encourage that, take it on board and work together to get the best result. And that takes work too. Any other question? Yes, sir. In considering a career of public service, it's often easy to get discouraged or feel like there's no more hope. Uh, what's your best advice to keep that inspiration and keep moving forward? So it's an important point about how to stay hopeful and believing. We can and should be proud of what the United States of America stands for. This nation has been a beacon of hope to the world about freedom, justice, equality, democracy, and the rule of law. That's the calling that brought my grandparents here, as Bob talked about, after surviving the Holocaust, which my mom also survived, having been born in a concentration camp. That vision of the United States of America is one we cannot forget. When I was here as a student, Ronald Dworkin gave a lecture I mentioned him with the word integrity and in the book Law's Empire has held up really well. And I asked him, what do we take from some of what the Warren Court worked on in the 1960s, where a lot of civil liberties were being developed and defended, equality and civil rights. And he said, we remember a vision and a commitment to justice. We have gone through dark times before in our history and we've come back from it to live up to our best ideals. And we have to believe we can do that again. When I would ask my grandmother, how did you survive and believe in a better future? She would say, it's easier to believe. So I would encourage you to take that positive approach. And if you want a little bit of the explanation why, look at Amos Tversky, who's talked about in this book called The Undoing Project, where he says, don't be a pessimist, you suffer twice. We're involved in that case too. And we are an amicus because the US government is the one challenging the law. There are times when states do something that is a threat to liberty and a threat to other states. And in those cases, our interest in Colorado are impacted. There will be people coming to Colorado 
to receive abortions because they can't get them. To underscore how cruel the Texas law is, many of you know this, many people won't know they're pregnant within six weeks. And if you are pregnant because of being raped or victim of incest, this law doesn't make any accommodation. Sentencing you to give birth to a child that could cause you great mental anguish. There's lots of other circumstances that will lead individuals to make that choice. I believe that is an individual's choice and that from the perspective of bodily autonomy and equality, it's not for the state to tell someone that they have to bear a child. Now, I am worried because the Supreme Court is considering Roe versus Wade this year. And that is going to be a critical challenge for the court as an institution. We will see whether there can be five votes to continue to preserve Roe versus Wade, a precedent that has built up a lot of reliance. We'll be involved in that as well. Joe, I believe in this country, like you said, it's, it's extraordinary, America, its values, what it's all about. A lot of people say we're on the verge of a civil war, that there is great division in our country. Are we divided? And if so, how did, how did we get there? Why did it happen? So there's a lot that is happening in the world that we live in that is accentuating division, polarization, and demonization. One of the elements that right now is clearly involved is social media. The algorithms on social media tend to engage people by taking them down particular rabbit holes. For example, Thomas Webster was there on January 6. He used to be a New York City police officer who was in Mike Bloomberg's security detail. He showed up in full body armor that day. When he was asked why, he said because he'd seen countless videos of people like him being beaten by police. How did he go from being a law enforcement professional who was honored to being a criminal, watching countless of videos that took him down that rabbit hole? People are living in different information environments, being conditioned to demonize other people, to see themselves as being victimized and to see others as oppressors or as unworthy of respect. That is fundamentally unhealthy and dangerous to democracy. The premise of democracy is we are all citizens in a project of self-governance together. And it's a responsibility that we all have to work together to solve problems that has to include listening to other people. That's a vision of how we are e pluribus unum that is under a real threat right now. So that's a lot for us to work on. And we start with ourselves. How can we work on ourselves? How can we not get pulled down our own rabbit holes, believing what algorithms will try to drive us to, which can often be engaging, riveting, but ultimately unhealthy. Well, we were privileged tonight to be in the presence of an extraordinary professor, dean, lawyer, attorney general, the Attorney General of Colorado, Phil Weiser. Let's give him a round. So for those of you who have any openness or interest in an internship in our office or a fellowship, please come say hi. I would love nothing more than have more NYU students come work with us. So thank you. Phil's going to stick around. I'll stick around. Normally we would be over there uh, sampling succulent and delicious food. But tonight, let's do it with Phil and ideas and questions. Next year. Next year. <laughs> thanks for coming. Uh, thanks to those of you who are out there on Zoom. And as Phil says, next year will be a better year. <laughs>